Yes, um, this might be, if someone of you know OLS, uh, we are, are still OLS, Open Life Science, uh, but uh, the program, the cohort program, we are calling it Open Seats now. And after a long uh, community-based um, redesign or rebranding, uh, there's going to be a blog about it soon, so you can check if you're interested in that. So, um, oh, can I ha get the help like going yeah. through a slide so I can just check the notes? Yeah. I'm not very good at memorizing anything, so I need to kind of. I'm not going to read, but I'm going to pretend I'm not re reading. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that. So, my name is Paz, and I work with o Oles. Um, as a coordinator, program coordinator, and community researcher. And I'm based in Argentina in a small city, five hours from here uh, to the south. So uh, OLS is a nonprofit um, organization, and uh, it is designed to teach and uh, train uh, people. And I say people because we welcome researchers from all sorts of uh, all disciplines. Um, so the idea is to teach uh, about techniques and processes that can allow them to become um, open science researchers and ambassadors as well. Um, so the idea is that can learn how to share their research with the general public, other communities, and their own communities. Um, we do this with open seats. So uh, open seats is in concrete terms, a 16 weeks long cohort training and a personal mentorship program. If you join as a one researcher, you have one mentor for yourself. And if you join as a team, you have still have one mentor, sometimes two mentors. So sometimes we have co-mentoring a, a project. And um, so the idea with OLS is that, I mean, OLS dreams um, to see scientific uh, research become much more truly, truly global, and being led by people that are often or have been historically marginalized and invisibilized. I'm not, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that well, sorry if I didn't, but, uh, um, and, and being left out by the ivory tower of science. So we want to uh, work with leaders or people that are introverted or extroverted leaders uh, in diverse fields and that I want to see them working in equitable ways, um, in ways that would allow them, us in general, to consider seriously um, the effects, uh, the side effects of scientific research in communities, in peoples, and the good effects and the bad effects as well. Uh, so we got to become conscious about that. So how can you become, or how can you participate in OLS? or become part of the OLS community. That's a screenshot of a graduation. You see funny faces and stuff like that. Uh, and so you can, you can become part as a mentee, as a mentor, as a facilitator, as an expert. Uh, often mentors have been mentees in the past. And so people experience different roles in, inside the community. And um, uh, for example, if facilitators, for example, are the ones that really help have the cohort calls run smoothly and and be effective and you know and do all the little things that are so necessary for the things to happen to work well and some of the one of the some of the advantages or benefits of joining OLS and we're actually really inviting you all to be part of it if you are not already uh, so <laughs> I'm trying to sell something here but let's see hopefully I'll do it anyways so one benefit is to gain a better understanding of how to make research more accessible and cheaper even. Um, for example, using open science hardware if you ever use it. So we, we cover issues like open science hardware, which are not often uh, mentioned. Uh, learn different ways of doing dissemination, uh, different ways of sharing processes. Uh, and the results of your processes with very different audiences. Um, understanding also similarities and difference between concepts like open access, open source, open SAR, uh, hardware, um, you know, the different open. And very importantly, and this we emphasize this, or yes, um, we really emphasize, is that learning about the reasons why not to share your data and your research, why not to. Uh, what are some of the reasons, um, yeah, you would have to not do that. Privacy, safety issues, 
and another set of advantages is gaining and and also we put a lot of emphasis on this interpersonal and community building skills a lot of what happens in OLS is to meet people to talk to people even if it's online uh, but again yeah, we have these conferences and <laughs> we meet in person but uh, and which yeah I would think that all researchers are very social and extroverted but maybe not so you know this the OLS Slack you know helps so we try to help build that skills and networking skills and um, and lastly having the chance to have a one-to-one -one mentorship experience that is um, very key to the program and one of the things that people mention is very important having having more direct feedback and permanent throughout the 16 weeks feedback on your project and and the projects can be already existing projects or all or, or new projects it can be both and some of the challenges that we often face or we as a participants face typical internet access power electricity and um, expensive supply chains when we when we get them uh, electronic goods headsets webcams stuff like that an interrupted time and space to take a call to be on the call uh, um, or just work on your project um, and the difficulty of, uh, difficulty of prioritizing uh, time to work on the project time some and language barriers um, uh, you know participating in the slack or participating in the calls the ones that speak english fluently of course have an easier time typical barrier and then other political and economic situations in the countries i don't know crazy inflation argentina knows a little bit about it but there are other countries that are going through similar stuff um so yeah enemy no thanks pass uh, I'm Emmy. I'm here with my hat as a co-director for Open Life Science. Um, so, Pass mentioned that you know these are some of the challenges that participants in the Open Life Science community and the Open Seas program face. Um, I just I want to add a note to say that you know we didn't learn all of this from day one. We learned by repeatedly working with our community to understand what they are facing and trying to be supportive and helpful where we can. So. Um, want to talk a little bit about our microgrants program, which is a program that we offer to uh, all of our um, mentees and also mentors since OLS 3. So we're now in OLS 7, which is our seventh iteration of the program. Um, that's We've been doing this for about two years. Um, so we, as Paz was mentioning, offer things like small electronics, um, mobile data to cover kind of that internet costs when you need to connect to a virtual call or just work on the project fuel because um you know some countries don't have stable power supplies and so the fuel fuels the generator that gives you that additional supply when you need it same goes to the battery um, modem router sometimes and child care uh, because as past mentioned, one of the challenges is that not everyone has the privileged space and time to be able to participate in such a program. Um, I'm putting laptop and computers last. Uh, if you want to ask me about it, I can also do that. But because these are often relatively expensive items, um, we weren't in a position to offer them until quite recently. And we've been kind of thinking about and working with the community. And people who request them has been really, really kind of flexible, supportive, and really want to make that happen as well. So we've, we've offered these like a handful number of times, but, uh, but yeah, so this is something special. Uh, project Seed Funds, knowing that a lot of people go through the Open Seeds program after 16 weeks, they do have a project that they continue to want to expand. Maybe they want to go to a conference with some swag and talk about their work. Maybe they want to buy some compute, right, to continue run, running their um, machine learning algorithms or whatever they need and other things we've got you know things like ring lights because lighting is not terribly good in at yeah, certain times of the day uh, night uh, other other examples as well um, so as i said we've been doing this for five cohorts by this point uh, one thing that I, this is some, a little bit of data that we're trying to pull together. We've made 70 grants to date, I believe. Um, and you can see that there's this increase across as we offer this uh, 
sort of consistently through the cohorts, um, I would say that the increase in uh, number of requests for grants that we've, uh, we've got uh, correlated with the increase in number of uh, folks from the Global South, especially joining the program. Um, the smallest grant we offered is seven US dollars. I remember it's probably for you know some data. Um, largest one is about 1,200, um, and mean is 175. And I, what I want to say um, with this data is that you don't need a lot to offer the support. I mean, again, a lot really varies depending on who you are. But I think from from my setting, from you know a global north setting, seven U.S. dollars is not a lot of money. Um, so so yeah, um, we we to date have offered this across 19 countries, and you can see that again, most of these folks are based in kind of the global majority. But also there are some cases in, for example, in the U.S. But you know diversity and inclusion is there's also intersectionality at play here. So I just want to make that note. I'm looking at my phone because I literally an hour ago asked for a story <laughs> from the community on, can you please tell me how the um, microgrant has influenced your participation in the program? I'm just looking for that story right now. And this uh, Jeff Sia, one of our um, uh, mentee turned mentor and facilitator um, has said, um, the microgrants ha that has helped me enormously. My online presence has increased by almost 200% thanks to the internet uh, donation. Um, it is also thanks to the micro support that he was able to prepare for his trip to the US last year as part of a Fulbright program. So um, this is some one of the 70 cases that, that we've, we've made here. Um, one important thing is that these microgrants really need to be accessible if you are thinking about running such a program. Uh, this includes, you know, really a minimal application process because you, what last thing we want is to have pages and pages of paperwork before you can get, you know, a small amount of money. Um, we also offer more flexible options such as paying for some of these things in advance, knowing that not everyone has a huge bank of money sitting, you know, under their pillow or in a bank account. So we you know, give them the cash up front and they would return the documentation afterwards. Um, we also, uh, knowing that some countries' banks are not really, you know, functional or, or easy to access, uh, offer things like cash pickups or mobile money, depending on what they need. Um, and one thing that we've learned is to try and adjust our budgets for micro grants. So give the um, mentee kind of like say, okay, you've requested these items at this cost, but Come back to us if you do need more because you're increase you're you're uh, you're going under you're undergoing inflation and the time that took between that offer and the purchasing has made a difference to what you need. So just to be flexible, honestly, uh, is the main message here. Um, the other thing that we do, again, going back to that point of like not everyone has the time uh, to and the privilege of that time to be able to participate, right? We and this is a network of diverse individuals willing to offer their time is crucial infrastructure for the running of open life science and open seats. We are committed to paying contributors where we can. Uh, we do this in the form of an honorarium. Uh, most of the time, I would say. Uh, this is a sort of a graphic from our one of our latest cohorts, uh, and the amount that we kind of have given to uh, mentors, facilitators, and speakers who contributed to the, their time and effort to the program. Um, there, we have an honorarium policy that outlines kind of how much the, these type of roles, what we typically offer, uh, again, Coming back to the point of flexibility, not everyone is in the position to receive that honorarium. So we are very cautious, conscious of, for example, figuring out, okay, if you know you are not able to take money in your bank account directly because of your other job or other things, can we pay for a travel or a conference on your behalf? So these are some of the ways that we have explored, uh, kind of making sure that we are we can still pay contributors where we can. And just the last last slide um, before I hand it back over to Pass. Uh, with all of that, there is a lot of infrastructure that goes into kind of making that happen. Um, we worked quite heavily over the last couple of years on building up a, a robust financial management system, which means that we work very closely with our accountants, 
thanks Pam, um, who, who were very patient with us in terms of like, oh, receipts are not gonna come immediately after you know the, the expense have been made. We will reconcile that at a later point, for example. Expense management systems where you know there is a form that mentees can fill in in order to request a microgrant, and then how does that get processed and making sure that this is documented uh, consistently so that any one of our team members can kind of look at that record and pick up the, the process as we go. Uh, budgeting as well in terms of like forecasting, okay, this is the amount that we have for, for a micro grant within this cohort. Um, you know, can we offer more what amount of flexibility that we have? All these are kind of things that we're learning to do on the way, but also a lot of time and a lot of trial and error, I would say. Uh, lots of software and digital infrastructure in terms of like handling all that data from banking information to um, kind of tr keeping track of requests and all this kind of thing. So all to say that there is a lot of labor of love um, and, and capacity building in terms of learning all of those skills across the team uh, involved here. But it's been a joyous process, but, but just want to acknowledge that that's also been um, a large part of, of where we're spending our time. Back to pass. Yep. Yeah, Amy has like 40 hours per day in her life. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the last one, the last slide is, um, this is, so uh, what's next for us? I mean, we're, for all us, um, um, doing the open seat programs, but now we have uh, more funding, which is very welcome. Um, it was uh, provided by the uh, NASA TOPS program. And it's interesting because it's gonna be for virtual cohort. Uh, both in English and Spanish. We will be doing this with Meta Ausencia. You probably, yeah, because of Laura's keynote, um, you know about it. So very happy with the extra funding. Um, that's going to be for three years of open science training. And uh, the content, the curriculum, was uh, created by the community as well. And the training materials are in that link. Well, this, is, this presentation is going to be available, so you can check. Or you can also check in our Twitter or our website. Or, yeah, so happy, happy about that, and happy to you know uh, do it in Spanish as well. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paz and Emmy, for that great talk. We have time for several questions. We have about four minutes. Oh wait, do we have time, or do we have to move? Hold on, let me look. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. That's <laughs> the end of day two. Um, we okay. We have time for one question. <laughs> if I want to apply to the program, how should I do? Um, very easy. Send me an email. <laughs> no, I have a new cards. Never had them, so uh, I need to give them to someone. Um, no, no, yeah. The um, uh, we're gonna open the new uh, the new cohort, the new open seats, uh, uh, the version number eight uh, soon. Uh, I should know the date. I don't, but then there is some details. So we had, don't have a specific date yet, but um, it's gonna be uh, in you know. Probably tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, and so we have like three weeks, and I mean, you, we announced the new cohort. We have three weeks in which people can send the application. That is a form, that is an online form they have to complete. It's not too long, um, but it's like, what is the problem you're trying to address with your project, and who's gonna participate, and why open, why you're interested in open. Like the idea is to kind of know, I mean, to make to make sure that the person has some idea of what is uh, open science, and not necessarily the perfect idea because the program is for that as well, as well. So we have had applicants that are very knowledgeable about open science, others that don't, but have a good kind of uh, good gut feeling about it. So uh, and yeah, so complete that application. You send it. Um, reviewers review it. Sorry about me for that. Um, and uh, not us. Ex external reviewers, but apart from the community, and, and then, yeah, and then you get accepted, probably, and then, and then you start. Thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause, please?